comfortable with those readings? <laughs> How many of you were sweating thinking, what is he going to do with that? <laughs> How many men think I should avoid such passages permanently? <laughs> we delve into what can only be described as preposterously treacherous territory these days. Looking at women, the role of women, wise living, and what it's all supposed to look like. But before we get deep into this, we really have to remember how important it is to actually read these passages and try to understand them. We can't ignore scripture or any part of it. It doesn't do us any good to do so. The other thing we have to remember is that texts like these we really need to know because they get used as weapons. They get used inside the church and outside the church, and the church itself has a lot to answer for when it comes to this stuff. We have a lot to repent of and a lot to improve upon, and if we want to pretend otherwise, we're lying. The Bible is extremely clear. There's no room for hate. There's no room for coercion. There's no room for violence in marriage. The biblical text is not meant to bang people over the head with, either the theoretically or literally. It is not meant for dominating. It is not meant for oppressing others. When we do that, when our reading of it turns out that way, we're doing it wrong, and we have to do better than that. If liberal churches, if mainline churches ignore it and refuse to talk about it, we leave the dialogue, you leave the whole conversation to one group of people, and they will take it in one direction. It's really incumbent upon us to face these kind of texts and roll with them and see what we can learn. We can also be part of the solution to a lot of the problems, like this congregation. We've raised thousands at this point. We'll do it again in December for the Cornerstone Housing for Women, which helps women who are fleeing from violence, no matter their religious background or why they're fleeing. But just because a text has been used badly in the past really doesn't give us authority to ignore them or to only use them, as many churches will, on Mother's Day, or at funerals, that's when these texts come up, and the occasional wedding, depending on what the bride and groom want. One commentator says, if you use it only when it says, comes time to say something nice about women, then we limit the message of the Bible. We place women not apart when we read scripture properly. We don't place them above, beneath, or outside the life of leadership of the community. The woman in the book of Proverbs is at the center of the life of a community. The goal of the book of Proverbs, you might remember, is not to make promises. It doesn't promise, if you do this, this will always be the outcome. It's making suggestions. For the most part, if you do this, this will be the outcome. And for the most part, it's going to be correct and accurate. Its goal is to describe wisdom to describe right action, and to suggest that we should do what we do, standing before the Lord with awe. It's about how to live practically in the world, in the everyday details of life. It really does say stuff about whether you should take out a mortgage or not. It says things about how to deal with impatient people. It says things about how to be a husband, and it says things about how to be a wife and how to be a mother. And I think it's important to notice that because the book of Proverbs initially is to the sons, and some people have emphatically over the years tried to use this as a way of saying women don't need to learn, men do the learning. But then right in the learning is how to be a mom. So that makes no sense. Clearly this is made for all of us to learn from, not just the men. Proverbs starts out early on, it says, giving prudence to those who are simple, knowledge and discretion to the young. Let the wise listen and add to their learning and let the discerning get guidance. The idea is that whether you start off as simple or young or knowledgeable or wise or discerning, there's still something of value and revelation for your life and your learning so we need to try to do what we can to not be so arrogant as to think we can't learn from these texts. The book 
finishes with a woman who lives out all of the principles in the book. That's the way it works. It starts out with a man teaching his sons how to live life, and it ends with a woman doing the living of the good life. None of us are going to do what that woman does. It would be foolish to try. It's full of hyperbole. So in that passage, it talks about basically never sleeping at all. That is clearly not the path to a good life and is contra other parts of the Bible, like in the Psalms, where it says God gives sleep to those he loves. So clearly, you're not supposed to live this out to the detail exactly as written. If you read it that way, you're, you're going to go crazy. But there's still something to it, right? There's still a reason we read it. Like all scripture, it's supposed to be useful for the teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training for each of us. And we live in a time, I think, when the Bible is not really thought by very many people to have anything at all to tell us about how we live. And in my experience, that's not just people outside of the church. I've known many people who don't think within the church the Bible has anything important to teach us. I know ministers who tell me that they don't have to justify their theological positions based on the Bible. They don't think they need to do that anymore. It's just not relevant. I also noticed that we have a lot of churches that are dying, and I'm not that surprised. We also have people living in a time of terrible loneliness. The statistics around anxiety and depression would be boring to read out loud, but they are overwhelming. The statistics in Canada around drug addiction, around a failure to thrive, it's evident. It couldn't be more obvious that what we're doing is not working. And so we need to find deeper, more thoughtful, more reflective forms of wisdom. And the church and the Bible has a way forward. The biblical contention is that God has made each and every one of us, and thus he knows how we can thrive. He knows how we can do better than this. If we have been trying something else, and we're really honest, we have to say, is it working? And if it's not working, then what do we do? Now, when you read this passage, it's helpful to remember you're reading a book that has many levels. The most obvious, straightforward level, the one that everybody's going to recoil at, is that this is a book explaining to women how to be women and how to be moms. But biblically, the notion is also true that everybody is supposed to marry the woman called wisdom. And then third, we are all actually supposed to be, as a church, the bride of Christ who fulfills the accomplishments of the woman in the book of wisdom. So there's three things going on at the same time. So we'll reflect a little bit about women, and I'm very aware that I'm the ultimate middle-class white guy when I do this. But I'm also trying not to just say what I think, but to read the Bible for what it says. If you read Proverbs, you'll notice that wisdom itself is personified as a woman, a woman worthy of pursuing. And then in the summation of the lesson, it is a woman who is capable and competent to live out wisdom. The careful reading tells you that this is not only something she does at home, but she's a wife who's part of the economy, and she's part of the politics of her day. The woman in the passage, it's funny, one of the elders saw that I was doing this and they laughed and they're like, oh, how are you gonna handle this? And then they said, you know, I've been married to my wife a long time. She never considered a field, bought it, or grew me any wine. We don't tend to think of women in the Bible as having the authority in their household, the wisdom in their household to be the main realtor involved, picking and choosing what lands they will purchase. And you'll notice 
She doesn't go home and ask her husband for cash to buy the land. She has access to all the money she needs to go buy the land, plant the vineyard, hire the employees, and manage the whole thing. That's not the story we normally assume when we think about biblical women, is it? There's a person who breaks down this whole thing named Telford Walk, and I just, it's a long quote, but I think it's really helpful. She says, despite the patriarchalism, this passage portrays a marriage that is neither egalitarian or inegalitarian. This is because it is not interested in comparing the husband and the wife to one another. Comparison, whether of equals or unequals, implies a kind of opposition But what characterizes the relationship here is mutual support. Generous and empowering, it flows from each other to the other in an overflowing of blessings in the family, in the community, the marketplace, and eventually the whole city. Such support takes different forms in different cultures with different gender role expectations. She rises early, not because of her subordination, but because of her determination. She helps her husband, not because he holds power over her, but because her character is trustworthy and her work is fruitful. Her business flourishes because of her own initiative and creativity. Her generosity is not coerced, but reflects a kind heart for the needy, for strangers and for children. She is energetic and strong because she has self-discipline. She is not an appendage or a bond servant to her spouse, but a true partner. Some will want to exchange or confuse this woman's strength for rebellion. Others will want to exchange or confuse her obedience for passivity. Both groups will miss the dynamic of the radical mutual empowerment on which holy families thrive. What's happening in Proverbs and over and over in the Bible, whether you know this yet or not, is an elevating of women within a culture and a dynamic where women are not normally elevated. It's a highlight, a spotlight on the good, the power, the dignity of women in the face of all that would diminish or undervalue or otherwise disdain them and their work. One really well-known author said that Proverbs 31 provides a polemic against the literature of the ancient world that saw women as decorative, charm and beauty without substance, and instead it depicts the greater heroism of moral and domestic rather than only exploits in battle. Historically, the only thing that mattered was being strong And as much as we don't like to always admit it, for the most part, men are strong. In our day today, the first line of this passage is really dicey waters. A capable wife who can find. If you know anything about incel groups, the involuntarily celibate, they use a line like this in the most horrible ways. It is very ugly, and I think we need to take it back. A capable wife, a capable woman, translates really as a woman of strength. Her behavior summarizes the virtues of wise living throughout the entire book, and we are called to follow it. To read it only at the level of what a woman is supposed to do, though, leaves a burden of expectation that is preposterous. Even Martha Stewart doesn't live up to this, right? Our elders' wives have done great things without ever yet buying them vineyards and running them. So we have to go deeper than that. That's not the only level it's intended to be read at. The idea is that everyone, men and women, young and old, should marry wisdom, the woman called wisdom. So like men and women of faith, you and I, we're supposed to devote ourselves to wisdom. Early in the morning, 
late at night for the sake of others, for the betterment of our families, for the betterment of our community, for the betterment of living well as one who loves God. This idea is not really new, it's old. But if you jump to the New Testament, we saw this, the bride of Christ is the church. The depictions of chastity, of generosity, of service, of hard work, of humility, they are meant to describe every single one of us who would be called part of the household of God. We are part of the bride of Christ, men and women alike, meant to do this. So like the woman in Proverbs, together we are somehow supposed to be helpful at home. And if you're following the analogy here, that would mean helpful in church. Coffee, other such things. Also outside the church, at the gate of the town, where the real estate is sold, where the politics are done. So that everybody can flourish. And we're not on our own. This is part of the thing you got to remember, that Christ does not micromanage the church. He gives us the spirit. He anoints us with the spirit so that we could do this. As a group of men and women, as singles and widows and spouses, feminists and egalitarians, together we become the bride of Christ. To read it well, you've got to recognize this passage. And you'd have to understand Hebrew, which I don't. To read it well, you've got to know this. That poem is an acrostic poem. Each line starts with the letter of the Hebrew alphabet and works its way straight through the alphabet. And whenever that happens in the Bible, and for the most part in ancient Jewish literature, the idea is to suggest a totality. Like everything you need is in this thing, right? From A to Z, it's all here. Just do this. And we need to remember that wisdom throughout the book was a woman calling out to everybody so that they all have the chance to build their character appropriately. In other words, wisdom leads to the sort of character and outcomes for men, for women, for households, for churches, while the foolishness that cries out in the streets advises us towards self-service, towards a lack of generosity, towards working as little as we possibly can, but gaining as much as we possibly can, preferably with as little accountability as we could possibly manage. Right? The foolishness that would say, I see society as something that must revolve around me, something I can take advantage of, rather than something I am a part of, a part that has rights and responsibilities. The humble Proverbs would say that wisdom and its goods speak for themselves. Wisdom may be defined as a life well lived, a life that matters. Somebody said that wisdom in the Bible is not enlightenment. Rather, wisdom is a lifetime of obedience to God, discipline honed in our daily decisions. Wisdom in the Bible is never mere knowledge. In our culture, knowledge is a form of control, exercised for the benefit of the one in possession of the learning, acquired through privilege, and maintained through credentialing. In, in scripture, wisdom is a way of life. It includes justice, humility, righteousness, compassion, and fairness. Wisdom is a quality that has less to do with charm and beauty and more to do with what the writer calls the fear of the Lord. That's the place where we all stand before God and in the words of Ellen Davis, we have the deeply seen recognition that we are not God. And that's good news for women and for men. I had a counselor once and he thought that there's always so much in your life you would like to work on. There's so many things you want to be better at at any given time. And so his advice was always to pick just one or two things and try to improve on those. I want to suggest that maybe the Spirit is asking us to do something similar in our own lives and in our faith. None of us can live as described in Proverbs 31. No woman can live up to this and men perhaps even less so. 
none of us can be so in love with wisdom, so enamored and devoted with every single breath that all we ever do is try to learn more and live out what we learn. That is simply not how we are made. But how is this then to uplift us? First, we would recognize that wisdom is available to everybody. Some of you really need to hear that. Some people have been taught that they are stupid and incapable and incompetent and might as well give up. They're never going to learn. Proverbs would deny that. It would say wisdom stands in the streets and it screams out to every single one of you and you are capable of learning. You are worthy of taking the time to learn whatever you set your mind to. Wisdom is available to every household, every workplace, and every church. And we can divide the tasks, figure out who's good at what, and move forward. If you feel at all moved to think more about this, if the feelings of res resonate with you, the ideas of anxiety, of worry, of underperforming, of maybe not thriving the way you think you should, you can read chapter 31 and try to be open to the spirit about one or two things that maybe you think are calling out to you to do, to improve on. None of us needs to do all of it. None of us can do all of it, but we can all do some of it. When the Bible says the church is a body with many parts and they are all needed, it's really quite serious. It means that. God calls us to become a household full of dignity, a place, place where people talk of peace and look for advice. In the end, the idea is if you marry wisdom, you let her change you, you can expect to come closer to God, to lead others to God, and when you do that, you grow in confidence and gain the peace you need. See, in this story, it said, Lady Wisdom looks to the future with confidence. And when I talk to people, many of us do not look to the future with confidence. We are terrified of the future. We don't know what's going to happen with our kids, our grandkids, our finances, our jobs. And now we talk about wars and we talk about climate change and on and on we go and we're worried about the future. And that's to say nothing of the worries people in churches have about churches. But I don't want to give you the impression that you just go ahead and do this and you do A and then B automatically happens. That's not what the Bible is saying. The gospel of prosperity is off the mark here. Wisdom at the beginning of this is worth more than rubies. The idea is that when you live biblically, you accomplish more than financial gain or power or prestige. That is less than what God wants for you. Anybody can have outward charm or beauty or success, but the book teaches that all of that is secondary to fearing the Lord. Remember, Jesus is described as one who is despised. He's the man of sorrows, the one people walk on the other side of the street just to avoid getting too close to him. He's the one familiar with sorrow. He's the one who doesn't seek out wealth and health. He seeks to serve. In the end, the passage, I believe, teaches us that the fear of the Lord, like what Jesus had, will inspire people to be faithful stewards of their time and their talents that God has given them, and that wisdom and its pursuit will be productive and beneficial for the person, but more importantly, for the people around them. No one has done this better than Christ himself. Jesus takes everything God has given him, all the power he has in the universe, and he refuses violence. He shows mercy. He shows compassion. He shows generosity. He shows love. He shows patience. He brings calm out of the storms. He says, I do not come to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom 
for many. That is a act of service and wisdom. If wisdom involves giving up your early mornings and your late nights and everything in between, Jesus dying on the cross for the likes of you and me and giving up all of it is the ultimate act of wisdom, an act of service. And so I would like to pray with you that we could somehow accept this. Lord, may we go from here enjoying the freedom you give us, trusting our ability to learn, trusting that every one of us, no matter what's been done to us or what we've done, can have dignity, wisdom, and worth. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.